Apologies in advance, we won't be covering the prophecy in detail. It's more of a broad brush approach and in an attempt to provide some relevance between the prophecies, which are obviously very old, and today. And I guess if there's one thing that I would like to try and achieve today, it's to highlight something that I think makes these prophecies particularly relevant to us. And it seems to me that in the world today, there's a growing darkness that's coming across the world. And it's a darkness that emanates from men's minds. And one of the causes and sources of this darkness is what I'm going to call tribalism. A sense that the affairs of men can be boiled down into simple terms. And I'm going to try and illustrate this afternoon that certainly in my experience there's only one thing that can be boiled down to simple terms and that's the gospel. But when we come to the affairs of men, they are not simple. They are complex. And it's because they are complex that when we go through the brief story of Jerusalem, we're going to see how it has become a virtually unsolvable riddle and paradox in the affairs of men. To go back, uh, not to the start, but going back uh, in early times, you can go back into the Bible story, the story of Abraham and uh, Isaac, and that we believe that uh, there were events there that were actually took place on Mount Moriah, which is in Jerusalem, as it now is called. And there's the Old Testament history. Well, I guess I'm just going to skip over the Old Testament history of Jerusalem and being established by the tribes of Israel under the monarchy of David and his successors. And bring us through to a period where Jerusalem was invaded and uh, fell to the overlordship of the Babylonians and the children of Israel had already been taken away into captivity in a preceding uh, series of invasions. The children of Judah, Benjamin and the remnant were taken away largely to Babylon and some luminaries such as Ezekiel and Daniel were part of this captivity. And then they came back and under the guidance of people like Zerubbabel, Ezra, Nehemiah and others, they rebuilt the city and they rebuilt the temple. And it brings us to a period in the history of Israel, the second temple period, which takes us right through uh, to the period of Jesus Christ. And of course Jesus walked and taught in Palestine and scripture in Luke 21 where he came into the temple precincts and he made a statement, he said, as some spoke of the temple, how it was adorned with goodly stones and gifts, he said, well, as for these things which you are looking at, which you behold, the days will come in the which there shall not be left one stone upon another that shall not be thrown down. And so it's of interest to us that Jesus Christ himself focused his mind on the destiny of the temple in Jerusalem. He went on to say that they shall fall by the edge of the sword and shall be led away captive into all nations and Jerusalem shall be trodden down of the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles shall be fulfilled. I have to beg your pardon, I cannot uh, for time's sake go into the full prophecy pertaining to the times of the Gentiles. But the prophet Moses spoke about a time that would affect the destiny of the nation and of the city. He talked to Daniel, the prophet Daniel talked about a time in history when Jerusalem would not be ruled by the heirs of David, but would be ruled by foreign powers. And Jesus himself draws our attention to these things. Just to digress, there is little doubt that was Jesus' challenge to the temple that was one of the immediate causes for the plot to arrest and kill him. 
because in doing that he was challenging the authority of the religious structure of the day. It's just a simple photograph of the Arch of Titus. I had the um, good fortune of being in Rome in 2007. My son had told me, oh, when you get to the Colosseum, yeah, just have a bit of a wander down the back. You know, there's all these old ruins, not much, just a bunch of rubble. So I wander on to see this old rubble, thinking, oh, well, they probably won't waste much time down there. And there in front of me is the Arch of Titus. Titus was the son of the Emperor Vespasian, who was responsible for the siege of Rome in 69, 70 AD, and finally uh, took Rome. And in this arch there, you can actually see there at the centre, the seven-branched candlestick. It's celebrating the fall of Jerusalem as it was taken by the Roman armies and leading away uh, a dispersion of the Jewish people, a diaspora, as it became known. And I'm thinking, there's my son telling me just a bunch of old stones. And here I am looking at the Arch of Titus with a tear in my eye. Um, when the Roman armies destroyed Jerusalem, they really did a good job of it. And if you're interested in these things, you can read a graphic account in the histories of Josephus. But the only thing left of the temple precincts was this wall, which is known as the Western Wall, also known as the Wailing Wall. And the Wailing Wall was essentially a retaining wall. And the temple precincts, or the location of the temple itself, sits above, at the top, on a plateau of this big retaining wall, the Western Wall of the Temple Mount. You can actually see a tower at the back there which is a more modern structure. And it became known as the Wailing Wall in later years because it's where the Jewish people return with their prayers of grief and looking for the Lord to sort of bring them back to Jerusalem. Moving ahead to the next slide, you've got the Romans who are now well and truly in control of Jerusalem. And, and so I've skipped over a bit. There's been a period where it's been under the foreign overlordship of the Babylonians, the Persians, the Greeks, the Romans. And the Roman period entered, uh, you know, around about the time, well, as I said, 70 AD, really, or just before then. And it extended beyond the collapse of the Western Roman Empire to the period we call the Roman Byzantine Empire, which was the Eastern Roman Empire, uh, named after the capital city, Constantinople, subsequently renamed Byzantium, subsequently renamed Istanbul, which it is to this day. And there in the, uh, in the picture you can see a dome, which is the dome of the uh, Church of the Holy Sepulchre, which is reputedly the place where Jesus was, uh, we're told, buried. Now, this was built in the 4th century AD. The Emperor Constantine converted uh, to Christianity, a form of, and his mother was instrumental in initiating building projects of churches and sepulchres and holy places. So this gives us an early indication that Orthodox Christian churches, Catholic, Roman Catholic, Greek Orthodox, Coptic, Armenian Orthodox, really had a stake in the destiny and future of Jerusalem because it became the site of some of their most holy relics. As you can appreciate, if you can identify and claim that you know the place where Jesus was buried, then that would be a very holy shrine in traditional Christendom. And so that's what that is. In the early 7th century, there was a great change in Palestine and the Bedouin Arabs uh, adopted a new religion, the prophet, uh, as he was known, Muhammad. And uh, there was a period of about 125 years when these Arabs who were infused with enthusiasm, vitality, and they were confronted with a form of Judaism that was only... Uh, there was not a lot of Jews there at that time. The... the Jews had been allowed to stay in Jerusalem, those that had re remained uh, through the Christian era. There was a certain degree of tolerance. And, and then, however, their religious practices were quite you know, dead. And uh, the Arab people were also confronted with a very 
a corrupt form of Christianity and actually you can see if you look into it it's little wonder that their minds were sparked by this uh, this new religion and they swept all before them and they established an empire in the space of 125 years that crossed into Persia up into Turkey right across North Egypt North Africa and up into southern Spain and that remained at the zenith of their empire and then they began building their own relics. And here on the Temple Mount, on the location where the first and second temple of the Israelite people once stood proudly, uh, they then built on this vacant block of land, because remember the Romans had destroyed the temple, they built their Dome of the Rock, as it became known, and next door to it, the Mosque of Aquaba. And the Dome of the Rock was a site where allegedly uh, the Prophet, as he was known to the uh, Muslim people, Muhammad uh, uh, rode on a mysterious winged horse-like uh, creature by night with the Archangel Gabriel and uh, he led the Prophets, including Moses and uh, Jesus and Abraham, in prayers on this site and then he ascended on a golden ladder uh, to meet with Allah. I'm giving it to you from the Islamic perspective. Now, regardless of how you know you may uh, and we may sort of look at such tales, and we hear stories like that in pretty much all religions, from the perspective of the people that have embraced these ideas, this becomes a very venerated site. And in the late 600s, this uh, mosque was built. There was a period of tug of war as the European powers that were now thoroughly a Catholic, and it's interesting, it's a digression, but there was these two great world religions emerging in different parts of the world, one in the Middle East and North Africa, and the other in Europe. And they were emerging concurrently. And uh, there was a period where the European powers decided that they would take Jerusalem back because it represented you know, one of their holy sites, and that led to the Crusades. Uh, they were temporarily successful for a period of about 90 years. Uh, the European uh, nations did manage to keep control, retake and keep control of Jerusalem, uh, but that was short-lived, and uh, they were again defeated, and a new breed of uh, people came in. There was the Mamelukes from Egypt, and then in the, the Middle Ages, there was the Ottoman Turks who came to power and became the new foreign overlords of Jerusalem. So, so far we can see that it's had a varied history. It's had a lot of masters. We have competing religions. Each of these religions claims Jerusalem as amongst its most holy place. Nevertheless, in the scriptures we've got prophecies. Prophecies that not only would the children of Israel be sent into a captivity and dispersed, but specific prophecies concerning Jerusalem. And some of these prophecies began to look to some of the early reformers, some of the early uh, the Reformation leaders began to look at some of the prophecies and there was some early writings in the late 1800s suggesting that something might happen in 1917. And they studied the prophecies of Moses about a seven times punishment. They studied and they found prophecies in Haggai. They looked at the prophecies of Daniel and it was particularly the prophecies of Daniel that interested some of them. Now, as it turns out, during the Great War, the British Empire forces decided in their attempt to defeat the Turkish nation, which had sided with the German people, and after the Dardanelles and the Gallipoli campaign failed, they nevertheless had an army in Palestine coming up from Egypt, led by one General Allenby. And I have to cut the story short, but essentially uh, we had these empire forces, including the forces of Australia and New Zealand, managed to 
get themselves right up before the city of Jerusalem. And over a period of days, there was a campaign mounted by this general to try and facilitate a changeover of power in Jerusalem such that they wouldn't actually have to destroy the city and fight with their modern weapons of war. And uh, they used their light aircraft, uh, bi-winged and tri-winged aircraft, and dropped pamphlets. Anyway, essentially, the defending Turkish armies decided that they would be better served to retreat beyond the city walls and mount a counter-offensive and leave the city um, unmolested, and it would be better militarily. So, as a consequence of this, the British leader, General Allenby, was able to enter Jerusalem, and he did so in December 1917. Now, I could commend to you, for those that are interested in the series of prophecy around 1917, a little booklet called As Birds Flying. And it details some of the amazing little, you can call them coincidences of history, or you can call them the plan of God. I'll let you make up your mind. But the detail is some of the most extraordinary details in respect of Bible prophecy that you'll ever find. In the book of Revelation, there's a scripture, and I might just digress here if I can. And Pastor Jock mentioned something the other day. Within the Revival Fellowship, we stand four square in a school of prophecy called the Historicist School. There's only three schools of prophecies that I'm aware of. One of them basically suggests that the bulk of prophecy sits at a time that's yet to come and we condensed into a period of seven years and great tribulation. Another school of prophecy suggests that the bulk of the Bible prophecy was to do with the early Roman emperors uh, after Augustus Caesar, and the, in other words, that period of about 100 years immediately following the period of Jesus Christ. But the great Protestant reformers stood apart from that and said that they believed that Bible prophecy was given as a sweeping expanse over time to show us many threads woven through the history of mankind. And we sit clearly in that school of thought. And it's very helpful to understand that that's where we sit, to be bold with that and to declare it. So in the book of Revelations, the river Euphrates represents the Turkish Empire. And the scripture is simply saying that it's going to be dried up, that a way of the kings of the east might be made. And that's another prophecy again, but today that it'll be dried up. Back in the book of Isaiah, it's an interesting little quirk of history again that in the, Church of Common, in the Church of England Book of Common Prayer, which was published in the late 1800s, I have a copy at home, it sets down in the readings for every day of the week certain scriptures to be read. And the scriptures that were to be read on December the 8th and December the 9th, 1917, come from the prophet Isaiah. And one of the scriptures says, As birds flying, so will the Lord of hosts defend Jerusalem, Defending also he will deliver it and passing over he will preserve it. And that was the day upon which General Allenby sent his planes across over the city to drop their pamphlets and upon that and subsequent to that the Turkish armies decided that they would retreat. In Isaiah 33 we read a scripture that was to be read, Look upon Zion, the city of our appointed feasts. Your eyes will see Jerusalem, a quiet home, a tabernacle that shall not be taken down. Not one of its stakes will ever be removed, nor will any of its cords be broken. It's just interesting that on the very day that the British forces walked into Jerusalem is the scriptures drawn from Isaiah some 40 years earlier to be read on that day about the restoration of Jerusalem. From what? Simply from foreign domination. We read in the book of Haggai a separate prophecy which says, consider now from this day and upward, from the 24th day of the ninth month, even from the day that the foundation of the Lord's temple was laid, consider it. This is talking about a Hebrew calendar. But it zeroes in on the same day of the same month. Is the seed yet in the barn? Yet as the vine and the fig tree and the pomegranate and the olive tree is not brought forth, from this day I will bless you. And it's a prophecy again concerning the destiny of this city. 
this city, Jerusalem, the city of peace. In Isaiah chapter 40, again to be read in the Church of England on that day, speak comfortably to Jerusalem, cry unto her that her warfare is accomplished. Her iniquity is pardoned, for she has received of the Lord's hand double for all her sins. Blessed is he that waits and comes to the 1,335 days. This is another prophecy. And again, this is one of the ones that some of the folk that were studying these things in the 1800s got onto and thought something's going to happen in 1917 because the Muslim calendar does not operate on a January-February basis, neither does the Hebrew calendar. And this, you can actually find coins showing that from October till December in our year 1917 is also in the Muslim calendar the year 1,335. So from the perspective of the students of history, something looks like it's going to happen at this time. And it all came to pass, as I said. That's actually a photograph there of Bill Allen. Um, General Allenby, an interesting thing, he had a sense of history. He walked into Jerusalem on foot. He chose not to ride in. A man that rides in on his horse uh, is coming in as a conqueror. He had a sense that he was no conqueror. He made a comment at the time that this moment, if I could just read my notes, this day the Crusades have come to an end. So he's a man that had a very strong sense of the hand of prophecy in what was unveiling with his life, within his armies, within the events at that time in the Middle East. So Jerusalem became... Uh, ultimately a mandate of the British government. Now, this is just a map that shows us briefly, broadly, where Israel is located. To the north you've got Turkey. To the north of Turkey you've got Europe with the Dardanelles in between. To the west you've got Africa. To the east you've got Iraq, Iran and further East, you've got the Asiatic continent. So Jerusalem, which is at the centre of Israel, and it's the centre of the Middle East. And so we've already seen that it has been through time the crossroads of competing religions. It is a crossroads of continents. And therefore it is a crossroads between competing political powers. And we've seen that, how that there was the various powers from Babylon to Persia to Greece to Rome to the Arabs to the Turks to the British. It's been a place that armies have just crisscrossed for thousands of years. You could argue that Jerusalem, the city of peace, has been anything but a city of peace because it is the subject of so many competing deeply embedded claims on it. In 1948, the State of Israel was declared an independent state by a vote of the United Nations, which was just formed after the end of the Second World War. And immediately a war broke out. There was a war with all of the neighbouring Arab states. I just got to go back a bit. I just want to give you another little bit of information to paint the complexity of all of this. Remembering that if there's one thing I want to impart today, it is complicated. In 1917, the British Parliament issued and signed a declaration called the Balfour Declaration, and in the Balfour Declaration, amongst other things, they made provision for the establishment of an independent Jewish state. But at the same time, within the space of the same 12-month period, the British Parliament signed a secret treaty with the French government called the Sykes-Picot Agreement, guaranteeing the sovereignty of the Arab states in Palestine. So <laughs> I'd call that hypocrisy. I'd call that duplicity. I'd call that double-dealing. But that is symptomatic, because on the one hand, there was, I suppose, a 
moral view that these people needed a homeland. There was pressure from the Zionist movement. But on the other hand, there was a realisation that there's oil in them, their hills. And we know we'll lose control of the oil because by, by, even by the early 1920s it was apparent that oil was going to be very important to the economic well-being of the industrialised world. So there's a lot of double dealing going on behind the scenes. And then the 1948 War of Independence when Jordan, Egypt, Lebanon, Syria all attacked but Almost miraculously, the little, uh, little Israeli state survives. And if I could just go back, the, the original Israeli state was there in the yellow. And as you can see there, very hard to defend such a piece of land that's almost divided in two by the big bulging grey, which was the West Bank, which was not considered to be part of the original Israeli state. And then there were subsequent wars through the 50s and it came to a head in 1967 when there was this famous Six Day War and it was in the Six Day War that the modern Israeli state developed a reputation for being, let's say, almost invincible because she fought a war with Egypt and with Syria and with Jordan and she crushed them through her air power. She seized the Golan Heights to the north from Syria. She seized the Arabian Peninsula from Egypt. She sent her tanks into and across the Suez Canal and seized the territory up to the Suez Canal. She seized the Gaza Strip. She seized the West Bank, which included the great object of their desire, the city of Jerusalem. Now, it may be a coincidence of history or it may be something that has another connection with Bible prophecy, that between 1917 and 1967 there's a period of exactly 50 years. And I'll leave that for you to contemplate that, but there is a concept in the Old Testament called the Jubilee period and the restoration of lands, etc. And it remains true that largely what happened in 1967, the occupied territories represented to a reasonably good degree the territories of Israel at its greatest peak under the empire of David and his son Solomon. However, during the 1948 War of Independence, three million ordinary Arab peoples, Palestinian peoples, fled from their villages, fled from their homes. Now, there was all sorts of things going on at the time. They were scared of the Jewish armies. They were being encouraged by Arab governments to flee. But when they fled, they were not given any alternative citizenship. They fled across the border and they were housed in refugee camps. 1948, three million displaced persons. In 1967, there's another half a million displaced persons. There are refugees camps still in existence today that had their origins back in 1948. And I wasn't born in 1948. But I'd like to challenge your thinking here a little bit today. We in the West get so easily horrified at the violence that we see on our TV screens and it's so easy to develop a mentality of us and them, good guys, bad guys. But just for imagine, for a moment, imagine yourself being born with no homeland, no sovereignty, no one that would claim you as their own, no hope, no future, think of the impact on your mind, the poverty, and we wonder why the Middle East is such a burdensome stone to all peoples. And so the Palestinian people began there, as the Time magazine says there, their long search for nationhood, which they're still looking for. Various times during the last 20 years has been various Agreements. I remember the Camp David Accords between the President Carter, I think uh, Menachem Begin, and Sadat, President Sadat. One of the ironies of history is within two years of this agreement being made, Egypt was the first Arab country to recognise the right of Israel to exist as a state. President Sadat was assassinated by one of his own people. Later on came the further talks of the Clinton administration, and this was an agreement between Yitzhak Rabin 
and Yasser Arafat and the United States represented by President Bill Clinton. Within two years of this agreement being signed, Yitzhak Rabin had been assassinated by one of his own people. It indicates how deeply feelings run on this topic. Some felt that he was a traitor for shaking hands with Yasser Arafat, who was the head of the PLO. Now we have a new regime, and now we have new efforts. And you've got the Israeli Prime Minister, Benjamin Netanyahu, and you've got the American President, Barack Obama. And he's just come back, I'm sure you're aware, from the Middle East, and well, he hasn't come back yet, he's still there. And the process and the search for peace goes on. Just a step back, though, getting back to the point that Israel sits at the crossroads of three great continents. It sits at the crossroads of history in a conflict between three great religions. And we see here that there is conflict not just in Israel, but all through the Middle East. And I only have time today to just show you this slide because... These conflicts are related. To this day, the only state that's actually officially recognised the right of Israel to exist is Egypt. Now, there are other states that have indicated quite clearly they want to live in peace with Israel. Jordan, one of the governments of Lebanon. But there are other states that are just as determined that they do not accept the existence of the Israeli state. And, of course, what's happened in recent times is more and more countries are getting drawn into the conflicts of the Middle East. This is a very old Time magazine. I saw this when I first came to the Lord in, no, it doesn't matter, 1979. And it just shows you that there are other interests in what's happening in the Middle East, and for many reasons, because it is, the, it is a crossroads. It's a place where if you control the Middle East militarily and politically, you have great power. If you control the Suez Canal, we discovered that 30 years ago. You have great power over the economies of the world. In 1979, violence intensified. There was wars between Iran, Iraq. There was the invasion of Kuwait. There was Gulf War Mark I. By the mid-1990s, America had discovered that she had a few enemies that hated her more than or as much as uh, their own enemies at home. And that moment in September 11, I think, is going to be one of the defining moments in 21st century history. And that moment... That event brought America directly into the affairs of the Middle East. Now, the thing is, you can have a good guy, bad guy mentality. You can look at it simplistically. There is us and them. But then we can step back and we can say, well, hold on. What's our core purpose? We're supposed to be followers of Jesus Christ. We're supposed to have a message of hope to the world. And in order to really let that light shine, we've got to be able to step back from the tendency that we all have to identify with this group or that group. Because once we go down that track, once we go down that tribalistic track, the trouble with it is we're not understanding the words of the prophets, that the Lord searcheth the heart and trieth the reins. The, the Lord is really not interested in the affairs of men insofar that it says in Daniel, the most high rules in the kingdoms of men. But nevertheless, we are, given these, we are given these prophecies. So are they given to us so that we can take some self-satisfaction and a certain sense of smugness, that we're on the right side? Or are they given to us to give us some warning? And I like the words of Sir Isaac Newton, who said in his view, paraphrasing, Prophecy was not given to us necessarily that we could predict the future, but rather that when things happen, we can look and say it is written. And in dark days, take comfort and have hope. The scripture in Zechariah, I will make Jerusalem a cup of trembling unto all that are about it, when they shall be in siege against Judah and against Jerusalem. And in that day, I will make Jerusalem a burdensome stone for all people. All that burden themselves with it shall be cut to pieces. Though all the people of the earth be gathered together against it. Just a photograph from a couple of years ago in the Israeli invasion of Jenin, of the Gaza Strip. And just to show and highlight, now this conflict affects the lives of ordinary human beings that have no say in the halls of power and the affairs of men. What does the Lord think of it all? 
And I just like to keep on bringing myself back to that position. What does the Lord think of it all? In 2002, the Israeli Prime, uh, Foreign Minister of the time, Shimon Peres, took a walk on the Temple Mount. Now that led immediately to another uprising of the Palestinian people. They were so deeply offended that he should just walk about up on the Temple Mount. You see, the Temple Mount is under the security of the Israeli armed forces. But the administration of the Temple Mount is still given uh, to the uh, Islamic uh, foundation of some sort that organises what happens up there. And for him, being uh, a Jew, to uh, stroll about up on the Temple Mount with heavily armed guards was a great offence to the Muslims. So one of the answers with the conflict today the Israeli government has built this wall. That's a massive concrete wall and it weaves its way through the West Bank and it cuts villages off from villages. It actually goes straight up the streets of some villages. And so you've had people that were in the same neighbourhood, now they're on the opposite side of this fence and the fence is designed to bring peace. Do you really think that a fence like that can bring peace? And I'm not saying that the fence is stupid, I'm just saying Jesus said, that there will be distress of nations with perplexity. Perplexity is a problem you just can't solve. And that is what we're dealing with in the Middle East and specifically with Jerusalem. And so now we have a world where families have been separated by this massive concrete barrier. I've briefly mentioned Iran. Iran, I'm sure it's no secret to most of you, is developing nuclear uranium enrichment programs. The Israelis have already bombed them once, about a decade ago, and they are threatening to do so again. Israel is armed with something between 200 to 400 nuclear warheads. In the last month, the Israeli Air Force has been conducting exercises, flying their jets to Gibraltar. It's approximately a distance of 2,000 kilometres. When the previous Israeli Defence Minister was asked, how far are you prepared to go to defend this country? He gave a precise answer, 2,000 kilometres, which is the distance to the nuclear enrichment power plants in Iran. In other words, they have no confidence in the ability of the West to negotiate with the Iranian state over their program and their desire to build nuclear weapons. Iranian scientists are known to be frequent visitors in North Korea. What we have, uh, it was reported in The Economist only recently, the President Barack Obama made an interesting statement, which essentially, paraphrasing again, was that the threat of nuclear war has diminished in the last 20 years. Fall of the Iron Curtain and other things. The threat of nuclear attack has increased and increases daily. There is material moving around the world illicitly. There are scientists being traded around the world. There are programs going on around the world. And so we have a nuclear armed state in Israel. We have a state that within two to four years, Iran will be nuclear armed. Iran supports movements in southern Lebanon, Hezbollah. Iran supports uh, the Hamas government in the Gaza Strip and the West is trying to negotiate with the Palestinian Authority government in the West Bank. And they're just not meeting. There's attempts, and where, where's it all going to lead? Well, Jesus, again, let's go back to him. He said, there'll be signs in the sun and in the moon and in the stars upon the earth, distress of nations with perplexity, and the sea and the waves roaring. And the sea and the waves simply symbolise the governments and the peoples of the earth. Concerning Jerusalem... That's it. No, it's not. A couple of questions. Who really belongs in Jerusalem? The Arabs? The Palestinians? The Jews? Which religion has the most significant claim? Islam? The Dome of the Rock? Judaism? The scene of the Old Temple? Christianity? The Holy Sepulchre? The place where Jesus was crucified? Should it be a place for mosque, or temple, or church? Who should we support? 
There are evangelical Christians in the United States who support these days a movement by some fringe elements of the, uh, of the Jewish nation, particularly zealot religious Jews, uh, to remove the Dome of the Rock carefully, a bit like they did the great temples in Cyrene in Egypt, to relocate it and rebuild a temple. I remember the late Pastor Les Capon saying to me in 1978, if you ever see that happen, son, hold your breath. Because I can't say the words that I think are used. They're probably not appropriate, but things will go wrong very quickly. So let's finish with what Jesus said. Our fathers worshipped in this mountain and you say that in Jerusalem is the place where men ought to worship. That's the whole thing, isn't it? Is it for mosque or church? What's it for? For Muslim? For Judaism? For Christian? What's it for? Who has the best claim? And Jesus said, well, I know that you make these claims. I'm talking in principle here. But he said, of course, the hour cometh when you shall neither in this mountain nor yet in Jerusalem worship the Father. Time has come when true worshippers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. I just want to quote here from a, a journal called The Economist that I took this quote from about two years ago. Because the current conflict has its roots deep in the histories and religious affections of all involved, which is why it is so perplexing and troublesome to all concerned. Because religious belief lies at the heart of conflicting claims over the city, compromise is difficult to reach and seemingly impossible to retain. When conflicting national aspirations and pride are mixed with religious zeal, the minds of men are ripe for the seeds of hatred. I believe that's what Jesus would have us to do. I don't think, frankly, it's appropriate for us as Bible-believing Christians to allow ourselves to get drawn into simplistic analysis of complicated problems, but to realise it is a mess. It is an unsolvable mess, but to take comfort in the fact that it is written, to take comfort in the fact that the whole argument that centres on Jerusalem, which is about sovereignty and about worship, is being solved by the gospel power of Jesus when he says, I'll make you citizens of another kingdom, and I'll give you the capacity to worship God directly in spirit and truth. And beyond that, I think we are but interested observers and we use the prophecy to alert men and women to the possibilities and the bigger picture. Amen. Thank you.